polling place in a very poor neighborhood of Providence. And this fellow worked at a, I won't say the company, but a retail operation. What's a right man? Yeah. <laughs> at a retail operation. And he got a slightly better job at another retail operation. And he said his boss told him he couldn't take it. I got into the weeds of it and was outraged to learn that, you know, someone who works at a pizza place or a grocery store or a sandwich shop could be locked into a low-wage job that was a non-compete. And so I worked at the legislature and we outlawed low-wage non-competes. My own view, I mean, having been in the venture business, I can make an argument there should be no non-competes or very limited non-competes. Even between a Google and an Amazon and a Facebook? Yeah, you can make the argument. There's no non-competes in California. I mean, legally. Correct. But there's also been proven collusion between these firms, right? Which is bad and illegal. So I'm just saying the non-competes have been way overused to essentially hold people's wages down to the benefit of companies. One could argue we should get rid of them totally. I would say at the very least they should be used in a limited, narrowly tailored fashion to actually protect the company's know-how and IP, which is fair, but it's time to rein them in because it's holding wages down. So there was a recent New York Times profile of you with the following headline, a rising star in the Biden administration faces a $100 billion test, that $100 billion being the money your Commerce Department will be distributing to help reshore American manufacturing, especially with computer chips, and also to build out green and clean infrastructure. The subhead of the article was Gina Raimondo, the Commerce Secretary, has made a career of tackling increasingly larger challenges. Could the next one be too big? I'd like to hear your reaction to that. And I have to say, as much as I'm rooting for you, it does seem like an awfully big plate full of things that you have a major hand in. Listen, it's hard. I've been in government for a dozen years. I was the governor. I had my share of successes and my share of mistakes. But I feel great about our chances of meeting the mission, which is to say, you know, 10 years from now, we will have a vibrant, deep, diverse, thriving semiconductor supply chain ecosystem in the United States of America. And, you know, <laughs> let's watch and see if we can pull it off. Uh, I'll laugh that, that shit off, bitch. Fuck you. You a fucking white supremacy, bitch. So that at the end of the day, it Fuck isn't, you. like you said, padding their bottom line, and it fundamentally leads to a resurgence. Put that shit in Cambodia, uh, motherfucker. In semiconductor manufacturing Fuck and you. innovation, by the way, in the United States. You know, that's the whole point. Everyone talks about how research and development leads to manufacturing. Put that shit in Laos. Manufacturing leads to a lot of innovation. And when we lost all of our manufacturing to Asia in search of cheap labor, we lost a ton of innovation and ability to innovate. After the break, what does all this mean for the other advanced economies to become a pillar of the post-war liberal international order? But over the past decade, China's leaders have made clear they do not plan to pursue political and economic reform. So this is a big deal. It's a big turning point, obviously, this moment in history, and you're at the center of it. Can you first give a brief assessment of where you see U.S.-China economic relations right now? Yes. Yeah, so I would say you know, we are fierce competitors. 